Well, welcome, everybody, and we are delighted to have a very special guest today, and that is the former Vice President of the United States of America, Al Gore. Uh, Mr. Vice President, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you, Senator Sanders, and may I say thank you on behalf of so many millions for your leadership on the climate issue. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who uh, reach high political life in our country and disappear. You have not disappeared, and you have chosen for the last many years to tackle uh, one of the most significant planetary crises that we face, climate change, and I thank you very much for that. And I know that in your efforts you have received a whole lot of abuse from <laughs> a whole lot of people, but you took it and you fought back. Uh, and you are just releasing, I believe this week, a brand new movie uh, called An Inconvenient Sequel. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power, will open in select cities on July 28th, and then it'll open everywhere uh, on August 4th. Uh, it will tell you everything you need to know about the climate crisis, about the solutions to the climate crisis, and how you can become an activist and help personally to solve the climate crisis. Uh, I want to encourage people to go to the website, inconveniencesequel.com. You can buy tickets in advance right there, and it will also uh, direct you to tools you can use to become an activist. There's a, a book that will be published the same day, has the same title, and it is a, a guidebook on how it, it also explains uh, the issue and the solutions, but it is also a, a guidebook for how to be a climate activist. Let me ask you this. It's been 10 years since you did uh, An Inconvenient Truth. What's changed in 10 years? Two big things have changed. Number one, the climate-related extreme weather events are way more common now, unfortunately, and way more destructive. Here in the U.S., just in the last seven years, we've had 11 so-called once-in-a-thousand-year downpours. Uh, we have seen all over the world how every night on the TV news is like a nature hike through the Book of Revelation. Uh, and yet the news media frequently failed to connect the dots and explain why these crises are occurring. The second big change is that we now have the solutions. <laughs> a decade ago, the solutions were visible on the horizon, but you had to rely on the technology experts to assure you they were coming, but now they're here. And in a growing number of cities and regions, electricity from solar and wind is cheaper than electricity from burning fossil fuels. There was a contract signed in one of our states two weeks ago at half the cost of electricity from burning coal or gas. And the cost continues to come down. Now the battery prices are coming down quickly, which is going to lead to a whole new round of price reductions in renewable energy. Electric cars are becoming more commonplace. Efficiency technologies don't get the same amount of attention, but they're really important and they're coming down in cost. So the problem's worse, but the solutions are here. We need political will. But political will is a renewable resource, uh, and people are rising up. The Paris Agreement 18 months ago was an historic breakthrough. And all over the country, activists are now being energized. We're working with Indivisible.com, uh, and, you know, their IndivisibleGuide.com is really a, a terrific uh, guide to to be an activist uh, on the climate issue, the health issue, and others. But we're we're counting on people at the grassroots level. Uh, I think, Mr. Vice President, most people in our country, despite our current president, understand that climate change is not a hoax, that it is very real, that it's very dangerous. Most people, I think, want to see us move to sustainable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, yet, we are seeing, especially from the Republican Party, all kinds of oppositions all kinds of opposition. Uh, what is the source of that opposition? What role does the fossil fuel industry play now? I was recently in Florida, Nevada, uh, Arizona, three states with enormous solar exposure, yet there's very little solar there. Why is that? <laughs> well, the, the fossil fuel companies and the fossil fuel burning utilities have used their legacy political and economic clout 
to control uh, those who they've captured in the state legislatures uh, to put obstacles in the path of energy freedom and energy choice. Uh, you take Florida. It is called the Sunshine State. One of these uh, carbon polluters said publicly, yes, it's the sun sun Sunshine State, but remember, it's also the partly cloudy state. And they have tried to make it illegal to lease solar panels from anybody but the coal-burning utility. You know, the, the, the carbon polluters have actually taken the playbook from the tobacco companies. There's a great book called The Merchants of Doubt that documents this thoroughly. They've hired the same PR firms, and they've tried to deliberately to confuse people. You remember very well, of course, when the scientific and medical consensus linked cigarettes to lung cancer and other diseases. The tobacco companies hired actors and dressed them up as doctors and put them in front of the cameras to reassure people that there were no health consequences. Well, the carbon polluters are doing the same thing, and they funded a major cottage industry of climate deniers and pseudoscientists just trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. And we're the only country in the world that has a conservative party that's wedded to provable idiocy on climate. Uh, and it, it is now beginning to give way because more and more people are seeing through the ruse. All right. What is the response? I'm on both the Energy Committee and the Environmental Committee. Uh, and what my Republican friend says, well, we're not scientists. We don't know. But we do know that if we move away from fossil fuel, the cost of electricity will become much more expensive for manufacturing, etc. We're going to lose jobs. What is your response to the question that moving to sustainable energy and energy efficiency is bad economic policy? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, offers an answer. Solar jobs are now growing 17 times faster in the U.S. than all other jobs. They predict that for the next 10 years, the single fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. All over the world, the brightest spot for economic renewal and dynamism is renewable energy and the sustainability revolution. That's why China is closing hundreds of coal-burning plants. Their emissions have come down three years in a row, and they're trying to create most of the jobs in, in China. India has now, since the Paris Agreement, done a dramatic U-turn, started closing their coal plants, and they're saying within five years there won't be any more new ones, and they are vastly expanding solar and wind. India just announced last month that within 13 years, all 100% of their cars and trucks will have to be electric vehicles. So when developing countries are moving faster than we are and harvesting the economic growth and jobs, it just highlights how we're hurting ourselves by letting the carbon polluters control public policy. The only remedy is for people at the grassroots level to speak up. And lots of people are, going, are planning to go to this movie, An Inconvenient Sequel, and to take others with them. And there will be organizing campaigns in every city uh, at the theaters where this movie is being shown. You mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, that when you did Inconvenient Truth, people were talking about technology. Yeah. And yet in the 10 years that have elapsed, there's been an explosion in technology. A few weeks ago, I met with some of the leaders in the solar industry and wind industry. And what they have said is, A, of course, solar and wind costs are plummeting right now. Right. And they expect that to continue into the future. Yeah. That without any subsidies whatsoever, solar will be far less expensive to produce electricity than fossil fuel. What is your expectation of what will be happening in the future? Absolutely. The cost is coming down dramatically. There's a scene in this uh, movie, Senator, where I went to one of the most conservative Republican cities in the country, in the heart of oil country in Texas, Georgetown, Texas. A conservative Republican mayor, but happens to be a CPA. And he, he ran the numbers. And they made a commitment, and they have now completely switched to renewable energy, 100%. And their utility bills are going down, and they're getting more jobs as a result. So he's not doing it because he's a big-time environmentalist. He's doing it because he's saving money for the community. Absolutely. And in some, there are several utilities in Texas now 
that have a new rate plan. From 9 p.m. at night to 6 a.m. the next morning, you can use all the electricity you want for free because it costs them more money to shut the turbines Isn't that down at night. Yeah, the, the concept is zero marginal cost, and it's changing the economics of energy all over the world. Now, recently, uh, Chile, I think, negotiated a contract, which, if I am not mistaken, uh, will allow for the cheapest electricity ever produced on this planet from utility-scale solar. Is that correct? That's correct. 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour. And if you don't speak kilowatt hour, that's less than half of what the cost of electricity from coal is. Abu Dhabi also signed a contract, 2.42 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, unsubsidized. And actually, a contract under three cents per kilowatt hour was signed two weeks ago in Arizona. Wow. Um, let me ask you uh, this. Let's, let's move away from electricity production to transportation. Yes. Which, obviously, a transportation system is a huge emitter of, of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, what's your sense of the future of transportation in this country and around the world? All of the major automobile manufacturers in every country are switching to electric vehicles. Volvo just announced that in the next model year, they won't have any internal combustion engines. They'll have hybrids and EVs only. We're seeing uh, the big switch I mentioned in India. We're seeing the cost of electric vehicles now come down even without subsidies into the affordable range. And when you look at the cost per mile traveled, it's already less than the equivalent of a dollar per gallon uh, uh, for gasoline cars. Uh, transportation has now overtaken the generation of electricity in the U.S. as the largest source of emissions in the U.S. It's about 20, it, it, it's uh, about a quarter, but worldwide it is still in, in the teens. But there's an explosion of cars and trucks around the world, and so it's really important that we accelerate this shift to electric vehicles. I just got uh, another electric vehicle, and I'll tell you, it's the best-made car. It, it drives so well. The pickup with electric vehicles is way faster and better uh, than for internal combustion engines. We're now seeing electric buses uh, come on the streets of cities. So the future for transportation uh, is electrification. Uh, and do you see the price for hybrids and electric cars going down in the years to come? Absolutely. The new uh, consumer model that Tesla put out is eminently affordable. Electric vehicles have been seen as available really only to those with enough money to right. afford them, and that, that has been a barrier. But now the cost is coming down dramatically. Uh, and that's why all these uh, th these manufacturers around the world are switching to them. And you're getting new entrants into the marketplace. The The entry barriers to internal combustion engines are very high. Not so with electric vehicles. And we're seeing an explosion of new models that people really are enjoying. One of the major technological breakthroughs in recent years has been the creation of batteries in the sense that they can now store uh, making electricity uh, 24 hours a day, in a sense. Talk about the potential of that in terms of, of the growth of solar. A great question and really a central point because the renewable energy has always been uh, what they describe as intermittent, right. and uh, it's a fancy word for saying that the sun doesn't shine <laughs> at night and the wind, and the wind doesn't, doesn't blow. Right? The wind doesn't always blow. Uh, and one of the reasons why those utilities I mentioned earlier are giving the electricity away for free at night is because they have so much of it. But if, but now the battery prices are beginning to drop very, very quickly. There are new battery uh, approaches, new chemistries. Lithium ion is the one we always hear about. Uh, and that's the first mover that's dominating the market. But there are a lot of new chemistries coming into the marketplace. And as the batteries come down further, the combination of affordable battery storage and renewable energy generation will completely transform the energy sector. Uh, the, 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 coal, the fossil fuel burning utilities uh, talk among themselves about what they refer to as a utility death spiral. In Europe, a lot of the utilities are moving faster than they are here in the U.S. to switch over 
to renewable energy. But we have this problem in our political system where big money calls the shots all too often. You've been so great in pointing that out, Senator, and congratulations on proving that a campaign can be run now on only on small donations. That's what's needed to revolution our, revolutionize our politics. But so long as big money has its current influence, then they can use their lobbying and their campaign contributions to, to force the state legislatures under their control to hold back solar and hold back wind. But, you, you know, uh, this is not a partisan issue. When people, I mean, the head of the Atlanta Tea Party was contacted by the Koch brothers wanting to uh, get their support for uh, uh, holding back solar, but she had just put solar on her house, and she said, wait a minute, and she contacted the Sierra Club, and they formed a new group called the Green Tea Party, and they defeated that legislation in Georgia. And similar uprisings are now taking place all over the country. I think what you're saying is whether one considers on oneself an environmentalist or not, people are going to understand that if you want cheap, sustainable electricity, we're going to be moving to solar and to wind. Now, I know that you have been working hard not only here within the United States, but all over the world, including developing countries. Yes. Uh, and the argument from developing countries has been, why do we want to move away from coal? Uh, when we didn't cause this climate change. It was the United States, it was Europe, maybe China, it wasn't us. Uh, what does this revolution in sustainable energy mean to developing countries around the world? Well, it's similar to what happened with telephones. You know, back in 1980, I was serving in the Congress here in D.C., and I was an early adopter of one of those big, clunky, early model cell phones. Around that time, AT&T asked for a study of how many mobile phones could they sell by the year 2000. And uh, McKenzie came back and said, good news, 900,000. Well, actually, uh, when the year 2000 arrived, they sold 900,000 in the first three days of the year <laughs> uh, and 128 times that much for the year. And the reason is the big growth was in developing countries, in poor countries, because they were able to leapfrog the development pattern that we had followed, and instead of stringing these, putting these telephone poles and wires all over the place, they just went straight to mobile phones. And if we could do that, we would now. I, I hardly ever answer my landline anymore. It's just a telemarketer anyway, and people use their mobiles. Well, the same thing is true with solar panels. There, there are so many people in the world that have no electricity, but now they have the opportunity to get it with cheap solar panels that don't require the, the, the landline electricity grids. So there's, a, there's really an incredible explosion of these panels being installed in West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, these are, India. These are people living in isolated villages who now right. for the first time in their lives will have access to reasonably inexpensive electricity. That's correct, and it's happening. There are 300 million people in India alone, almost the population of the U.S., that have no electricity. And they wouldn't get it if they waited for the old coal-burning uh, utility grid. But they are getting it now. I have a friend who sells these things, and he was telling me of his effort to sell one to a woman householder in India. She said, no, 30 rupees a month is too much. And he said, well, what about one rupee per day? She said, you've got a deal. And what that illustrates is their new business models, pay as you go. Uh, and now they're selling these ultra-low power um, uh, DC television sets connected to the solar panels. So it's transforming the way of life in developing it, countries. It, it seems to me uh, that if we had a sensible president now who half understood the crisis and the need to move forward, what we'd be talking about is making it easier financially yes. for people who don't have the money now to install solar, Yeah, that we'd be investing in solar and wind and so forth. Um, all right, I think our time is, is running out here. Our, um, I want to thank you uh, again uh, for being a leader, not only in this country, uh, but in the world, in calling attention not only to the crisis, but to the solutions, uh, to rallying the people, not only in America, but all over the world. What we are talking about is the future of this planet for our kids and our grandchildren, uh, and the need for the American people to stand up and to tell the fossil fuel industry that the lives of our 
future generations are more important than their short-term profits. And you've been doing that. Uh, and I thank you very much. And I hope uh, that this new movie is going to be the kind of success that I know it will be. Well, thank you for your leadership, Senator. Your voice has been clear and compelling, and it means so much to so many of us. Go to the website, inconveniencesequel.com. Get your tickets in advance. The movie is an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, and the book of the same name. Thank you for having me today. My pleasure. Thank you. One, two, three. Ready to go. Five, four, three, two. I really wish I could be with you in person for this tremendous event because small businesses are the cornerstone of our local economies. When you help small business succeed, it helps the community. So thank you for all that you do to help the small and medium-sized minority-owned businesses here in the Tampa Bay region. A few months ago, I held a series of roundtable discussions with small business owners from all around the state to discuss a bill that we had filed to cap the tax rate for small businesses at 35%. Now, as you know, under current law, many of our small business owners are being forced to pay a tax rate almost up to 40%. And while larger corporations are only paying a max of 35%, well, that's just not right. So earlier this year, I met with uh, Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine, and we filed bipartisan legislation that would allow small businesses to pay either the individual rate or 
the corporate rate, whichever is lower for them. And it also caps the maximum tax rate for all small businesses at 35 instead of the present current law of 39.6. So it's just one small way that we can do to help small businesses succeed. And it's an idea that a lot of us just got directly from small business owners like you, uh, that you keep giving us great ideas. So please keep those ideas coming and let's continue to do everything that we can to help small business. Thank you again for all that you do and thanks again for inviting me to be with you today. I really hope that you have a wonderful event and wish you the best for future success. Thanks a lot.